Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Garvin Virtual Public Seminar, Get Into Your Genes. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the Zoom room and also a number of newbies. Welcome to the Garvin Institute. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mara Jean Tilly and I have the great privilege of heading up the Garvin Research Foundation, which is the marketing and fundraising arm of the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. Before we begin, please join me in paying respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which the Garvin Institute is located. We recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today we're going to talk about DNA, our body's instruction manual made up of the letters A, G, C and T, unique to each and every one of us, unless you're an identical twin, but we'll get to that later. Almost every disease has a genetic component. And here at Garvin, we have a strong focus on genomics research, the study of all of the information encoded in the genome. Our fundamental goal is to understand genome biology and its impacts on disease and health. Our vision is to use all the information encoded in our genome to better predict, diagnose, treat, and ultimately prevent the diseases having the biggest impact on our community today. In today's session, you'll hear from our uh, genomics educator, who will take you through the fundamentals of the genome before you hear from two of our scientists about their exciting research projects leveraging the latest in genomics technologies. A little bit of housekeeping. We're very excited today that we will be including a live Q&A, so we will do our best to allow for as much time as possible for your fantastic questions, which you can submit via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Should we not get to all of your questions today, please do send them through with your name and email address via the survey at the conclusion of today's session. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce Bronwyn Tyrrell. Bronwyn is a science communicator, educator, researcher and writer at Garvin's Kinghorn Centre for Clinical Genomics. Bronwyn's responsible for developing street strategic, forgive me, approaches to engaging and educating the public and a professional professional audience in genomic medicine. Bronwyn is also an investigator on a number of national and international projects focused on genomics workforce and education, teaching with molecular anim animations and community engagement with genomics. Bronwyn, we're delighted to have you here today. Thank you very much. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, right. Uh, thank you, Mara Jean. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to hope for the best. Here we go. So hopefully everyone can see my screen there. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, wonderful. Uh, so I'm really excited because there are so many people to talk to about genes today. Um, I've been working with and talking about DNA genes and genomes for many, many years. Um, and I'm really aware of how fast this area is advancing. So it's really hard to keep up. And when I keep I embark on a new program or talk with my colleagues, I actually have to learn something new each time as well. So what I'm going to do today, hopefully, is give you a little bit of an idea. We're going to meet your genes. We're going to give some insights into what your genes are and why they matter. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of how genetics is happening, uh, is, is managing to change healthcare. And I'll finish with a couple of examples of how our education research and our programs and resources are helping people to learn about genes. And and why we think it's absolutely important for everyone to know about them. So it would have been easier if you were right in front of me, but I know that there's, there's people listening. Um, to begin with, I'd really like to know what springs to mind when you think about DNA and genes. When we asked this question two or three years ago at, in a project, which is Genios project, which is the National um, Insights on Genomics project, um, we got these different answers. And you can, it, the size of the letters actually reflect how often we heard the word. So if we look closely at the different terms, then we're talking about a mixture of science fiction, 
which reflects the sort of futuristic or the advancing knowledge. Um, some of the terms that we know that people use to um, describe the structure of genes, there's some deoxy in there, there's some mRNA, there's some chromosomes, and some attitudes that they had to the science. And I'll be put my hand up right now and say, I'm one of the nerdy ones, I love this stuff. But the interesting things here are that some of these ideas are around family, around coding, about the, instru in the instructions that we have encoded in our genes, and also about our health. So I'm going to build on some of these in order to be able to give you a brief introduction to our genes. My plan is to talk over a couple of the videos we've made to help people get into their genes. These are some of Garvin's most watched videos. And so if you're interested, you can find them on our Garvin YouTube channel with a perky little soundtrack on top and a different voiceover. So here goes. Press play. So DNA is sometimes described as the book of life. It carries instructions for living things like you and me to grow, develop and function. And these instructions are continually copied and read throughout our lifetimes. Any changes or variations in the DNA instructions can actually make a difference to how a living thing develops or how it responds to its environment. And the complete set of these instructions, the many different books of life put together, is called a genome. Your human genome library is made out of more than 6,000 million DNA letters spread out over matching volumes of information. And we get one of each of those volumes from mum and one of those volumes from dad. Now, the DNA letters in our library actually represent chemicals along the DNA strand, known as A, C, T and G. Mara Jean mentioned them earlier. And just like in a book, the order of the letters actually matter because in our cells, sections of DNA are read and used as templates to make useful components in our bodies, usually proteins. And even small changes or variations in these genes, we call them variants, can affect the way our bodies look, like the shape of our face, or the color of our hair, or I guess most importantly to the work that we have at Garvin, it can actually affect our health. Now, sometimes a variant means a different protein is made, and that might not work as well. So your body might not work as well as it should. Sometimes the protein might not actually work at all. And that can cause very, very severe conditions. A single change can make a huge difference there. But now that we can look at the whole genome, we're also understanding about small changes and variants that are outside genes that can turn a gene on or turn it off. So the good news is that we're actually getting much better at being able to read our DNA and find these variants. So we sequence the DNA and we compare them to a sequence that was created during the Human Genome Project back in 2001-ish. We actually don't know what all the variants mean yet, but our researchers are working out which variants make a difference to health and disease, such as heart disorders or cancer, or variants that are involved in the way your body uses medications. And now we can use these variants, or screen for these variants, use them in diagnosis, or in different screening programs, or to work out which medications you could use in the future. So that's our brief introduction to genes. And one of the main things I wanted to emphasize from that is that the DNA actually underpins all of your body's working. So as Mara Jean said, that changes in our genes actually underpin many, if not all of human diseases. And what you can see on your screen are a number of projects that have received government funding, uh, New South Wales or federal funding, to be able to understand the genes and the variants involved in each of them. Now, when we were doing, when the Human Genome Project was being done, people thought that we'd be able to just open up the DNA and look inside, and it would be very easy to work out what caused each of these different diseases. But what we're finding in challenges of DNA research is that genes have different actions. So in some case, a single change can make a huge difference, a catastrophic result, a, a severe condition. But in other cases, it takes a combination of many different gene variants to be able to develop disease or increase your risk of developing the disease. So although the, all the clues are actually in the DNA, we need different knowledge, different capability and different tools to work out how you to use this information for health.
although it's early days, genetic information is being really useful in healthcare. My colleague Sarah is going to go further into this, but genomic research is making huge headway. So we can use it for uh, identifying variants in, for diagnosis or for risk assessments in families. We can also use it to be able to understand cancer better, understand cancer risk, and also to help cancer therapy. And also, finally, to look at our DNA to be able to understand how we process medications and therapies. So this is all happening now. And we know that this information can change people's lives. Uh, we're really glad to be able to tell great stories about uh, Alan and Ellie, about um, how Garvin's research is actually already helping people in healthcare. And a few years ago, I was able to listen to one of the parents of two children, Jaylee and Dali, who had been diagnosed through the work of the Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics. Uh, and she said that she'd had to experiment with a huge number of medicines that as a parent, she wouldn't actually want to give to a child. But then they did one genome sequencing test, they got one diagnosis, and now they have hope. So this information can be really, really powerful for families. So my, I work in the clinical translation team at the Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics. And we are focused on translating genetic information into healthcare. So we're trying to reduce the benefit gap between genomic research and also the patient or the participant. Our research is really looking at how best to prepare health professionals for using this information. Um, it's a little tricky because each individual is actually a unique combination of genes and environment. So the genetics is not the only thing you need to look at when it comes to precision medicine. The other thing is that genetic information is unique to you. So it's sensitive information and it, we, we like to take particular care to protect that. And similarly, it's shared with your family. So in order to be able to uh, make a difference to a family, people need to be able to communicate with their immediate families or their extended families about what this information could and couldn't do for them. So we do a lot of work um, with health professionals, with researchers, and with communities, communicating the importance and the limitations of the current genetic tests um, and technologies about with anyone who'll listen. And all the research and evaluation we've done into genetics and healthcare says that information and education is going to be phenomenally important in making sure these technologies are well used. So we've done things for physicians and GPs who don't feel confident with genetic information. Uh, we've been making resources with them for them to get their heads around different types of tests, what changes in DNA mean um, for a particular family and allow them access to our Garvin experts. We've built other information resources to help research participants understand what the, their choices are and to support their choices as part of a research project. And finally, we've got some similar projects supporting teachers to make sure that school education supports the citizens of tomorrow. So we are really focused on how this information can be used in better healthcare. And with that, I'd love to thank the people without which my, my work would be impossible. So the clinicians and researchers, our collaborators, our funders, and also the participants in our various studies. Thank you. Fantastic, Bronwyn. Thank you so much for that. I'm sure we're going to get lots of questions for you at the end. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Sarah Kummerfeld. Sarah is the scientific head of the Kinghorn Centre for Clinical Genomics here at the Garvin Institute within the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. Sarah uses genomics to understand human disease and translate findings into clinical diagnoses and treatment options. Sarah completed her PhD in computational biology at the University of Cambridge, working on protein structure and function prediction. Her postdoctoral research at Stanford University studied the molecular basis of human aging. I think I might have a few of my own questions on that later today, Sarah. Over to you. Thanks, Mara Jean. All right, let me share screen here. Okay, so um, you've heard a really great introduction to how DNA works and, and genes and what all of those pieces mean and how they're being used in healthcare. I'd like to take you into a little bit more depth and talk about how we're actually applying genomics now across the whole of an individual's lifetime. So here's a bit of a roadmap that shows you some of the um, ways that we are right now using genomics. And it starts actually before birth. So actually even before conception, we are starting to be able to use genomics as a preconception carrier screening tool. And I'll tell you more about what that means in a minute. 
during pregnancy in newborns and then once someone's grown up or as a child there are several other applications that are right now being used to improve healthcare. and the last one here um, is actually after somebody dies um, genomics is now being used as a post-mortem tool when we don't understand why someone died to um, to make a diagnosis at that point obviously we would prefer to get to those earlier and understand the disease all right so you've heard a little bit about how genomics is studied um, using DNA sequencing technology. I wanna take you through how we actually work through a genomic test. So first, people come in to see a genetic counselor and understand more about what the test is going to be able to tell them and, and what it could mean for them and their family and to give their consent. Then we take a blood sample or we can actually take a cheek swab as well. So it's pretty uninvasive. We take that sample and we extract the DNA, and then we put the DNA into a sequencer. And that sequencer then reads off the DNA, the entire genetic code. And then what we can do next, and this is actually probably at this point still the hardest step, is try to work out what all of that means and how it relates to disease. And the first step for doing that is that we compare the DNA from the individual here to a reference genome. So this is essentially a healthy genome that's an aggregate of uh, the genome from lots of different people. And we can use that to identify which of the regions or which of the particular spots in, in the um, patient's genome that are different from that healthy standard. Okay, so now I'm gonna take you through a few applications where we're actually now using genomics for healthcare. So the first one um, is in carrier screening. So Brahman already explained to you that um, every person gets some of their half their DNA from their dad and half from their mum. So you may have heard of diseases like cystic fibrosis. Um, these are recessive conditions where uh, if the mum and the dad both have a variant in, in the gene that's relevant to that disease, there's a one in four chance that they will have an affected child. So at this point, um, or until quite recently, I should say, we've had a um, series of testing regimes set up to help for small groups in the community that have high risk for these types of conditions. So cystic fibrosis is a good example. There are some communities where there are more, there are more people who carry those variants. And so we've started using screening for just a handful of genes in these particular populations that are at risk. The, way, the place we're moving to now is to expand that so that we look across the entire population and rather than just focusing on one or two genes, we can actually look at all disease causing genes. And what that means is that then um, parents to be can uh, make an informed decision about how they wanna proceed, including options like IVF, where they can actually make sure that they're not going to have an affected child for one of these debilitating conditions. Second area that genomics is having a really big impact is in acute care. So when a child is born with a complex medical condition, um, the, the standard has been that they'll undergo lots and lots of tests. They'll have lots of blood draws and it might take some time, weeks, months, or even years for them to have a diagnosis. The approach that's now being taken is what we call sequencing first. And so the idea here is that rather than doing all of those tests, you take a sample and you sequence their genome. And this is something that if we work hard, we can do in 48 hours, uh, including giving a um, interpreted result and the diagnosis. It doesn't always work that quickly, but, but we're, we're really starting to speed up for being able to do these diagnoses. And what that means is that we can then guide treatment because if we have been able to give a patient a diagnosis after just a couple of days, you're better able to guide what sort of treatment they should have. And we're already seeing this is decreasing hospital stays. So it's great for families, it's great for the babies, but it also has a very positive economic impact because just one or two days fewer in the neonatal intensive care and you've already recouped the cost of your genomic test so it's really a win-win another area that Bronwyn mentioned is diseases that are not just a single gene that's driving them but many genes these are things like heart disease breast cancer where there is really a complex interplay of the genes that you have many different genes as well as the environment so i want to explain that a little bit more if we think about this box here as 
um, your disease risk. And when you fill up this box, you have the disease. Everyone's born with a certain genetic risk. Let's just say it's to heart disease. So this person, about a third of their box is already filled up because they have some genetic risk because of the variants in their genome. Over time, as they get older, we fill the box up with other types of spots. Their age has, has a role and also their environment and lifestyle. So let's suppose as they get a bit older, maybe they took up smoking and then they didn't exercise. And at this point in their life, the box is full and they have disease. So you can see from this that it could be that someone is born with this box almost full, really high genetic risk. But if they're super healthy and have a very, you know, environment that's really not a risk for um, heart disease, they may actually never fill up the box. Equally, they, someone could have very low genetic risk, just one of these green spots. But if they had a lifestyle that means that puts them at risk of heart disease, they could still fill up the box. So what this really shows is that it's that interplay of genetics and environment and also age that leads to disease. Now, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that again. The picture looks more like this, where each of these spots is not the same level of importance. Some genes put you at much higher risk. You might have heard of BRCA1 and 2, which are put people at much higher risk for breast cancer. And some environmental factors or lifestyle factors are also filling up that box much more quickly. So each of these factors is a small risk, but together it contributes to the overall risk. And what we can now do with this information as we've started to understand which genes are involved and how they have an impact, is we can help people get into screening and treatment early and guide lifestyle choices. So for example, we might tell someone, you know, your genetic risk of heart disease is really high. You need to start seeing a cardiologist at a younger age or um, you really need to watch your exercise and, and diet more than somebody next to you. So I think this one has really huge potential to grow even further. We're just starting to be able to do this. And it's something that's only in its infancy being rolled out in the clinic. Another example I wanted to share is in cancer diagnosis and treatment. So um, genomics has been used for quite some time in cancer. And one of the areas that's growing now, and I think really exciting, is in liquid biopsy. So the idea here is that you've got a tumor somewhere in your body, and these tumors are always shedding or um, releasing little bits of protein and DNA. And that DNA and protein goes into your bloodstream some of the time. So if we take a blood sample, we can actually look through that blood sample with the sequencer and we can identify which parts of the DNA are just your regular DNA from your genome and which are from the tumor. And so what that means is that you can use this as a screening or a monitoring tool. So if someone's had a cancer and they've been treated and they're doing well, you can start taking blood samples periodically as a way of monitoring to see if that cancer has come back. It also in the future could be used um, earlier on in the diagnostic stage. And the nice thing about this, the reason we call it liquid biopsy is rather than having to take a biopsy of a tumor, you're actually able to take it from the liquid from your blood and it's much less invasive and something that you can do on a regular basis. All right, the last example I wanna give you I think is pretty topical. A lot of us have um, infectious disease on our mind with coronavirus where it is. And we are using genomics extensively um, in the infectious disease space. The reason um, that we've, we're using this approach is it lets us work out from a sample from a person who's sick, it lets us work out a lot about the infection. We can tell whether it's a viral infection or a bacterial infection. And within those categories, bacterial or viral, we can work out exactly which type of virus it is or bacteria, and that can guide treatment. For the coronavirus specifically, um, a team in KCCG has been working for the last year doing sequencing of the viral swab. So when, when someone goes for their COVID test and they have their nasal swab, if it comes back positive, those swabs are then sent to our team and they sequence using a tiny sequencer like this, same technology as this tiny sequencer, they can actually sequence that viral genome and work out who that person caught it from. So when you hear in the media people talk about um, the contact tracers are using the genomic information, um, that was really coming from, from this technology. 
And so the team um, worked out this approach that, that decreased the time needed to process genomes from 48 hours to about four hours. And they've now handed that on to two large hospitals in Sydney that have taken it back over doing this sequencing. As an aside, they also got the software to run on a mobile phone, which is pretty incredible. And I think um, while for us at the moment in Sydney, we don't need to run things on mobile phones, this is something that makes this whole technology portable and it can be used in very remote communities in cases like Ebola outbreaks, where being able to sequence quickly and understand the process of transmission is critical. So I wanted to leave you with these ideas that I really think precision medicine is, is finally within reach. It's something we've talked about for a long time and we're now starting to really see improved health outcomes from genomics. It also has the potential to reduce the healthcare costs. Sure, genomics is not cheap, but the cost savings by helping people avoid serious disease or treat it appropriately can actually outweigh that cost. And it also allows us to think more about disease prevention so that we're not always being reactive and treating a disease, but we're actually getting in ahead of time and telling people you're at risk and we've got to be prepared. So I'll leave you with those thoughts and um, thanks very much again also to all of our supporters, the King Horn Foundation and many government grants that we have as well. Amazing, Sarah. Thank you so much. And I'm going to come back and um, uh, get you to talk a little bit more about the COVID-19 rapid testing during the Q&A time permitting. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Cindy Ma. Cindy co-heads the Immunology and Immunodeficiency Laboratory in the Immunity and Inflammation theme at Garvin. She's a member of Garvin faculty with a co-joint appointment with St Vincent's Clinical School and UNSW Sydney. Cindy is part of a large and incredible uh, clinic, clinically driven uh, research study called CIRCA, where we're integrating some of these technologies in the diagnosis of, uh, in particular, children, but also young people with rare uh, immunodeficiency and autoimmune conditions. Cindy's aim is to determine which genetic variants result in disease susceptibility um, in order to provide a molecular explanation and hopefully improved targeted treatments. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Great, thank you, Mara Jean. And I... I'm going to share my screen. Thank you for that introduction. So yeah, um, as Mara Jean pointed out, I'm um, an immunologist and I work in the um, immunity and inflammation theme at the Garvin Institute. So what does that mean? So firstly, what is the immune system? Um, and the way that I like to think about it is that um, we're constantly getting exposed to pathogens such as viruses and bacteria, parasites and fungi. And really it's our immune system that prevents us from getting sick. And the defenders of the immune system are white blood cells. Um, and these are found in our bloodstream, so in our circulation, as well as um, very specialized sites such as lymph nodes, um, such as those that we found in our neck. So immune deficiency, um, autoimmune and allergy are all things that we study at the Garvin Institute. And these are really words to describe when there are issues with our immune system. So for today's presentation, I really wanna focus on some of the work that we've been doing on immune deficiency. So immune deficiency is when um, our immune system can't fight off infections. In particular, we work on primary immune deficiencies, which is when um, it's a disease which is caused by defects in genes. And we've heard a little bit about genes from Bronwyn and Sarah today. And as a result of these defects, we have a bad or non-functional immune system. So what do I mean by a defective or mutated gene? And again, just to recap what Bronwyn has um, spoken about earlier today. So genes are found within cells and genes are made up of DNA. And the DNA contains instructions for making proteins. So when a gene is defective or mutated, it's when the gene is altered, such that it's giving the wrong instructions. And as a result, as a result of this, the proteins are actually um, either not made at all, or the protein that is made does not function properly. 
So now I want to introduce you to Keegan. So um, Keegan's story was highlighted in The Age in um, 2012 and Keegan was 15 years old at the time. But we actually started working with Keegan in 2007 when he was around 10 years old. And the problem with Keegan was that he was getting pneumonia all the time. He was getting these cysts in his lungs. And as a result of that, he was in and out of hospital for months on end on um, IV antibiotics. It turned out that Keegan actually has a primary immune deficiency called hyper IgE syndrome, also known as Job syndrome, um, named after the biblical character Job. And hopefully after the next slide, this will be evident why that is so. So Job syndrome is a rare primary immune deficiency. It affects about one in 100,000 individuals. And it's really characterized by these recurrent and fungal um, skin infections. Um, so as a result of these bacterial infections, they get these boils all over their skin, which is thought to um, resemble Job from the Bible. They also get recurrent pneumonia as well as allergies. So interestingly, patients with Joe's syndrome also have these bone or connective tissue defects. And so this is described as having quite broad facial features, a high palate, um, they retain their primary teeth. So I don't know if you can see in this x-ray here where there's actually two rows of teeth. They have extreme flexibility as well as scoliosis. So it turns out that Job's syndrome is actually due to a defect in a protein called STAT3. And what does STAT3 do? Well, STAT3 is found inside B cells, which are antibody producing cells, as well as helper and killer T cells, which fight off um, in, immune um, dysphoria. So as a result of mutations in STAT3, the B cells as well as the T cells do not function properly. So now I want to um, introduce a case, um, which I'm going to call case one, um, Miss X. And this case really highlights why we needed Circa, and it was one of the cases that really kicked off Circa as well. So Miss X was um, seeing Dr. Winnie Tong at St. Vincent's Hospital next door. She was a 61-year-old female at the time, and she was referred to us as having potential Job syndrome. So if we go into her clinical history, Miss X had um, a history of severe allergic disease since birth. She had eczema, asthma, food and drug allergies. Um, she had recurrent infections, so lung infections and the bacterial skin infections. And she also had some um, bone and connective tissue defects. So she had thoracic scoliosis and extreme flexibility. So I hope you agree with me, this did sound a bit like Job syndrome. So what do we do? So we then got blood from Miss X and what we're able to do is isolate out her immune cells and using a technique called flow cytometry, we're able to look at the phenotype or really the characteristics of her immune cells. We could also isolate out T and B cells um, and look at how they behave in a petri dish. And we could look at how they function because um, we know the function of Job, um, Job syndrome defective T and B cells. And when we did all these experiments, what we actually found was that um, Miss X had normal STAT3 function, i.e. she's not likely to have Job syndrome. So herein lies the problem. What now? What does she have? What do we do with her? And the consequences of this is that there's often diagnostic delays. The patients go in and out of hospital with lots and lots more diagnostic tests. This results in treatment delays increased mortality and morbidity, as well as increased healthcare costs. So we start asking, what can we do? Well, what we really need to do is find that defective gene, which will then hope it help with diagnosis, with therapy, as well as hopefully lead to new therapies as well. So our mission was actually to perform whole genome sequencing to reveal defective genes. And this is really how the Clinical Immunogenomics Research Consortium Australasia, or CIRCA, was started in 2015. And it's this large collaboration between pediatric and adult clinical immunologists, research immunologists, geneticists, bioinformatics specialists, molecular pathologists, as well as genetic counselors. And we have the common goal of performing whole genome sequencing on patients to reveal gene defects. So this is a very busy slide, but what I really want to highlight is that we've really grown to 150 members now, and this encompasses um, people from the major hospitals and research institutes in Australia and New Zealand. So briefly, what is the circuit pipeline? So this starts with a clinician who sees their patient 
And if they think that there might be a gene defect causing immune deficiency, they then present the case at our monthly circa meetings, which are now done via Zoom. Um, we decide as a group whether we go through the research arm, so we um, do more experiments in the lab, or if we go straight to whole genome sequencing, which is done at the Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics. If we get a diagnosis, it's really fantastic. If we don't get a diagnosis, this then goes towards the research arm. And Sarah's already talked about how we can then look at the different variants um, to see um, and decide which ones may or may not cause the disease. We um, perform functional experiments. We do more phenotyping to characterize the patient's cells. And we may even make animal models of the variant to see if that is disease causing. Importantly, all this information is um, then talked about and um, presented again at circa meetings. And then it's also um, gone back to the clinician and the patient to hopefully improve clinical care. So what are our outcomes so far? We've actually sequenced um, upward of 150 individuals from 70 different families. We've gone to genetic diagnosis in 40% of cases. Um, and this includes um, defects in genes known to cause disease, um, new variants in genes known to cause disease, and excitingly, as well as new gut genes that had not previously been shown to cause disease. And as a result of these outcomes, we've actually been able to have gene-specific therapies, and some of these are listed below. And I'm um, here, I just want to highlight some of the other um, circa outcomes, and um, these are all stories of different individuals, um, children that have been, and adults as well, sorry, that have been highlighted in the media of um, where we've had our successes. So what about Miss X? What happened to her? So she went through the circa pipeline, and we actually found mutation in filigrin. And so filigrin is a protein that binds keratin in the skin. So finally, at the age of 63, we've gone genetic diagnosis for Miss X. However, I should say that her case is somewhat more complex and she's still um, in um, the circa pipeline and we think there may be something else. So really, I wanna leave it at that um, and share our funding partners. Thank you. Fantastic, Cindy. Thank you so much. Really um, inspiring to see medical research having a direct impact on the lives of patients and particularly these individuals who've had years of uh, diagnostic odyssey and, and poor health. So um, really exciting stuff. Now, I will, um, I'd be delighted to welcome our other speakers back to the panel. So Bronwyn and Sarah, please do join us. Thank you very much. I think you all did a fantastic job in communicating today. We, we really appreciate that. We've got some great questions coming through the Q&A function, and I would encourage anyone in the Zoom room to keep, keep them coming if you so wish. So the first one I will uh, ask Bronwyn. And this is a question about, uh, I guess, ge genomic diversity. So the question is, just to be clear, across humanity, is there similarity in the sections of our genome uh, and then individual combinations of letters within that section. So we've spoken about um, every individual having a, a unique genome. Perhaps you could just extrapolate on that somewhat. Sure. Um, no, so uh, it, it, is, it is tricky. Uh, so we do have a huge similarity between people. Uh, around about 99% of our DNA is actually similar. But across 6,000 million letters, that is millions of differences, um, somewhere between three and five million differences between you and me or the person next to you. So it's actually what those differences do that make a difference. So if they're in a gene section that is being um, read by the cell and turned into a functional piece like a protein, if that change makes a difference to the protein and how it operates or functions, that's when you start to get the challenges with, um, in some cases that might be protective for you, but in other cases that may actually change the way that your body works and uh, change the risk of you developing disease or me means that you actually have a disorder. So it's really about the location of that variation, but we are phenomenally similar. Does that help? I think that's great, Bronwyn. And what would what would the typical um, proportion of variant differences be, say, between uh, you know a mother and child? That's a hard one because we're a lovely blend of each other, but we're about fifty percent similar. 
um, across our immediate family, uh, parents and uh, siblings as well. But we're all a different blend of our parents. So it makes it fun to be able to work those things out. But it means that during diagnosis, um, sometimes what we will do is also uh, sequence the parents in order to be able to work out which changes across the genome are actually involved with a disease and which ones are just our natural variation. Fantastic, thanks Bronwyn. Uh, Sarah, I'll ask you the, the next one, please. How do identical twins differ in their genomes? That's a great question. And it's actually something that's only been studied fairly recently um, because people just, I guess, assumed that they were identical. You know, their genomes, they, they, come, they come from a single cell that's then split. And so um, what they've found in studies where they have actually looked into this, it, it depends exactly when the split happens, right? So you can have some twins that are more similar than others, but even um, the most identical twins will still have a small number of differences. And this is where um, there, there have been some changes after the split, uh, but bef in their genome, which happens, that's how we have differences um, even if we were just an exact copy of the parent, you wouldn't be exactly the same. You have some variations that occur just through each cell replication. Um, but it, so yeah, so it depends when exactly the split happened between the two as to how many different variation there is. But it's, it's very small compared to what we're talking about between even um, siblings that are not monozygotic twins, like 10 changes. It's fascinating. And then presumably uh, what Bronwyn was talking about in terms of the environmental impacts, that then contributes to any further changes seen in those identical twins. That's right. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, Cindy, this one I'm going to throw to you. How does one get involved with research? Uh, the questioner says, I have been diagnosed with what is listed as a rare disease. So perhaps you could tell us how would somebody typically get involved in Circa? Yeah, so it, um, it, you require a clinician to um, refer you to Circa. So presumably you are seeing a specialist such as an immunologist. Um, so in the Circa pipeline, that immunologist will present your case at Circa. Um, and I guess you get involved that way. Fantastic. So, so obviously we, we can't provide uh, clinical advice here today, but for our questioner, please do talk to your specialist, um, talk to your GP to get a referral to, to a specialist if you don't currently have one and ask them to explore what options there are for you uh, at Garvin, but also elsewhere in terms of participating in research. Thanks for that excellent question. Sarah, I'll come back to you on this one. And this is fantastic because this is a question that I wanted to ask around the COVID-19 whole genome sequencing. So when you and the team sequence the COVID swab to find out who they got it from, is that because you can identify the person from human DNA on the swab? No, sorry, I didn't get to spend enough time to really drill into that. But so what we're sequencing for the, for the COVID swab sequence is the viral sequence. So we're not doing any human sequencing. It's only the virus. And, and actually the method we use cannot sequence the human um, DNA. We're using a particular method that's only pulling out the virus. And the reason we can work out sort of, as I said, who they got it from is we've actually in Australia been very fortunate. We've sequenced the virus from, apart from maybe at the very beginning, we've sequenced every single person who's had COVID all of the people in hotel quarantine. And so that means what we have is essentially the tree of life of COVID in Australia. And so when someone new gets COVID, we can look across that whole tree and we can say, this sequence from the virus that you've got is most similar to this branch over here. And so then that's how we can work out because the virus is always undergoing more mutations, variations in its genetic code. And that's just normal, that's how viruses um, just work. And so if you have caught it from one person, your version of the virus is going to look much similar, uh, more similar to that person than to someone who, I don't know, caught it four generations before. Fantastic. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Bronwyn, 
good one for you, please. One thing touched on was turning genes on and off. I'm curious how this can be done on such microscopic material and how does it continue to work as the body continually recycles cells? So I'll take the second part of that first because that's the easier way. Um, the body is absolutely amazing. And so starting from a single cell throughout to our body, we are continually copying the DNA. So every, every cell that um, divides, the DNA is copied before it divides and moves on. So um, as you can imagine, that but the machinery then the cellular machinery to make that happen has to be pretty great um, it continuously copies it it's working through that much dna at all, any time and it's also proofreading to make sure that it doesn't make mistakes as it goes through so all of this is happening at a microscopic level the turning genes on and off is actually something that we are really still only learning about um, when the human genome project uh, finished they had an idea of where all the genes were and then started to really realize where all the regulation was in the genome because we really aren't hugely complex at a genetic level if you just look at the genes we're you know similar to a fruit fly or a or a, or a worm but that's not reassuring how, i know i know but it's how we use the genes that matters right so it's about when things are turned on and turned off when um, different genes are expressed in different cell types and we are really only coming to grips with that and in particular um, situations and particular disorders that's starting to be understood so we know that they're silenced we know that there's environmental interaction we know that there's um there's regulation in there but that's still evolving. Sarah might like to say more about that. Can I, can I add one thing? Because I did my PhD on a lot of these aspects, which was there are proteins in your body um, that actually bind to the DNA and turn the genes on and off. And so something that I worked on was trying to identify all of those, we call them transcription factors. So I was trying to identify what are all the transcription factors that we have, because they're also encoded in the genome. Um, and by doing that, you can start to understand which gene is regulating which other gene. And so, yeah, as Bronwyn said, there's a long way to go, but we've also made a lot of progress in the last 20 years. And often when we find someone has a problem, you know, a variation that's causing disease, it can be because of those regulations. It can be because of the switch to turn genes on and off is broken. And so, Sarah, a very quick follow on uh, question from another member of the audience um, is, uh, is the environment involved, uh, environmental factors involved in this switching on and off as well? Absolutely. Yeah. So the, these signaling pathways is what we call them that um, lead to the genes being turned on and off. They a lot of them start outside the cell. So there are signals that the cell picks up from outside and that are carried through a series of different proteins that then lead to that transcription factor that I mentioned, actually turning the gene on and off. It's really complicated and amazing. Thank you so much. Cindy, uh, a question for you here on Circa. Are all Australian specialists involved in Circa? And I guess the follow on question would be, um, how does somebody find out what specialists are involved to, to participate, potentially participate in Circa? Yeah, so I, I yeah, I can't say all um, specialists are involved in Circa, but we're very open. Anyone that wants to be involved can be involved um, and details of that are on the Garvin website. Um, we have a project manager. I had her email address up on the last slide, but um, Karen Enterwin is really fantastic. So get in contact um, with her, um, like specialists. Yeah, any specialist can join and get fantastic. involved. So I'd encourage anyone in the Zoom room who, who would like um, to receive some follow up communication specifically on Circa, perhaps pop your name, your email address and uh, your phone number into the survey at the end of the session and we'll have somebody get in touch with you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of great questions here. Sarah, I'm going to come back to you. What is known about the genetics of ageing and are there mutations that cause a longer lifespan and health span? Yes, there are. So there have been some fascinating studies on centenarians, people who've lived to over 100, um, to try to look at what are the genes or the, you know, the, the variations in the genes that lead to longer lifespan. I would say it's still research in, in, in its infancy. And it's interesting for the reason why it's actually very hard to study because it's different in different animals and, and from humans. 
Um, and so that was some of the work that I was doing in my postdoc was to look at the differences between say humans and mice in, in terms of you know, which genes are important for aging. Um, I would say watch this space. We can't really change our genes. So I guess you, you, know, you can't make those changes for um, improving lifespan. But the thing that you, you can do, we're starting to understand which genes are turned on and off in people who are living longer. And those are things that could have environmental impact. So I actually think it's, it's going to be a, a farewell coming, but I think we will be able to eventually take drugs or eat certain foods that will allow us to get those genes turned on and off in the right balance that will actually increase lifespan. Um, people are already trying things like resveratrol, which is in red wine. I think the jury's still out whether that's actually real, but maybe people will enjoy their life better anyway if they're having that red wine. So. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I will share one anecdotal uh, example. We had one of our longest serving uh, donors and partners for the future in the building yesterday. This gentleman is 105. So I would like to propose that there may be an association between being a Garvin supporter and a long and healthy life. Only got one example, but uh, hopefully more to come. Uh, okay, so lots of um, lovely, lovely compliments coming through on, on the Q&A as well. Bronwyn, I've got two questions that I'm going to pose to you. The first one is essentially, how does um, a member of the public get access to genetic screening and how close are we to having affordable and reliable screening tests in Australia? Uh, so there's a few parts to that question. Um, I think at the moment, uh, the idea of genetic screening and genetic sequencing. So there are certainly genetic screening programs that are running um, uh, across various populations in Australia. And Sarah might have something else to say about that one. Um, but uh, we, it, the access to whole genome sequencing at the moment is primarily around diagnosis. So it's about people who are looking to be able to identify whether they are carrying a particular variant and whether that information could actually help um, the health of their family or themselves. Uh, and other than that, there's a lot of research going on at the moment. Um, but there are things coming out, coming through now with government funding for genetic screening for particular disorders um, and, and also some uh, preconception screening that Sarah was talking about before that is available to populations to be able to understand whether they have a chance of passing on um, variants that could be risky for their children. So uh, these are on their way. Uh, the, the funding is coming through. So we're expecting to see a lot of this really translating in the next five to 10 years. Thanks, Bronwyn. And I think the answer to this one at this stage is unfortunately no, but are there any blood tests available to identify specific mental diseases? That, uh, it, there's a lot of research being done in that area, uh, but in terms of reliable uh, tests, uh, that's really in research. Watch this space. Cindy, I'm gonna throw this one to you if I may. Gene replacement therapy, how does this work? Re-CMT. Uh, smart CMT, sorry, I'm not familiar. I'm not entirely sure myself. Um, what about, what about, how much do you know about gene replacement therapy? Am I throwing you in the hot seat? A little bit, it, yeah. It, um, it's definitely in its infancy, but clearly there's a lot of research, um, you know, gaining into that. And I guess that differs from bone marrow transplantation where you replace all genes with um, something like that. So yeah, it's, it's good to get the targeted approach but, and a lot of research is getting done on that. But yeah, it's definitely still in its infancy. Okay, fantastic. So we might we might come back to that uh, topic in another seminar if that's something that we've got a lot of interest from the audience on. Uh, Sarah, as we build our knowledge on COVID, can Australia be used as the control group for worldwide measures to deal with COVID? I would say we already have been in some ways. Um, I think you know we've demonstrated through um, the the really very um, active approach to management with lockdowns and and contact traces and so on, what can be done. Um, more broadly though, we're an interesting population to study vaccination because unlike other countries, almost nobody's been exposed to the virus. And so there is active work. I have a, a visiting scientist in my group who is part of the vaccina vaccination um, group in New South Wales. And 
So what they're doing is studying the impact of vaccination and um, trying to understand exactly how the immune system is responding. And so we're getting involved with that on the genomic side. Um, and really what they'd be able to show is how, how effective is your immune response when it's not, it's definitely caused by the vaccine. Because in other countries, you'll never know, right, whether it was the vaccine that gave you that immune response or someone walked by and sneezed and had COVID. So, so yes, is the answer in, in several different ways that have already happened and continuing to. Amazing, Sarah. And I think we should all be very, very proud for, for the, the work that our scientific and clinical community have done in managing COVID in, in Australia, although I appreciate there are ongoing challenges as we're seeing in Melbourne right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I will get in trouble if I run over. So allow me to take this opportunity to thank Bronwyn, Sarah and Cindy for their incredibly informative and very compelling presentations. If you have any questions that have been... Forgive me. If you have any questions that have not been addressed through today's presentation, please do enter them into the survey at the end of the session. Uh, we had been speaking a couple of months ago about the strong desire to bring the public seminar series back on site to Garvin, and we were very much hoping to be able to do that in the second half of this year. I think the recent cases in Melbourne suggest that it would be a wise approach for us to continue with the online format. Forgive us, Bronwyn, I know you'd love to see everyone in person until uh, we get through the end of this year and everybody's been vaccinated. So stay tuned on that. We do hope that you'll continue to join us online in the Zoom room. And now we're going to pop up the survey soon and we really value all of your feedback, positive and negative, on how we can improve your experience with Garvin and with the public seminar series and the Bite Size Science series. So please do take a moment if you can to give us your full and frank feedback. If today's work inspired you, please do consider donating to Garvin's work. We rely heavily on the generosity of the community for our incredible medical research, and we're grateful for the support that you've already given and hope that we will be privileged to have that continued support uh, for the coming months and years and indeed decades. Everyone, stay safe, stay well. Hope you have a wonderful day, and thank you once again for joining us. See you at the next one. Bye.